بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the Arab Household Savings Conference 2022, the annual savings focused event hosted by Fintech Robos. I have the pleasure of presenting this vitally important conference, which is growing from strength to strength with expanding topics and many impressive speakers. We would like to thank Zurich and all our partners, as well as our speakers, without whose support this event couldn't have been organized. Now I'd like to uh, pass the mic after this short video to Nurhan Azan to start off the day with session one, the role of financial literacy in households' financial decisions. Thank you and please enjoy the conference. Thank you. Good morning, everybody who's with us today and um, all our esteemed audience joining this wonderful conference this morning. Mr. Brahim and Fintech Robos, thank you for having us and for the kind invitation. Um, I'm actually very pleased to be the panel that is kicking off this esteemed conference. Very happy to have my um, panelists here to, with me to be discussing session number one, the role of financial literacy in households risk taking and investment decisions. Um, of course, I already mentioned that it's a pleasure to be here with such a wide range of experience on the panel. I want to kickstart by introducing the panelists who are with me today. We're joined with William Tomey, the Senior Regional Head, Middle East North Africa at CFA Institute. Ms. Elena Mativa, Senior Economic Directorate of Financial and Enterprise Affairs at the OECD. Iman Benzarel, Deputy of the Executive Director at the Moroccan Foundation for Financial Literacy. And of course, we would have been really pleased to have Iman Safar, the Head of Financial Services at the EDB with us, but um, sadly, she's not feeling very well, so we're wishing her a speedy recovery. Um, William, Elena, Iman, good morning to you. Uh, very excited to be running this panel with, here, with you today. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for having us. Of good course. Good morning, Norhan, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. OK, so just to kind of uh, brief our audience, today we'll be speaking about the role of financial literacy and households risk taking and investment decisions. With the support of my panelists, I hope that we're going to shed some light on several key aspects around this topic, but mainly we'll be digging into savings, investment, risk taking, and of course, we'll touch on the impact of psychology on these areas. So first, um, ladies and gentlemen, if I can start by setting up the ground for this discussion, um, we've been hearing a lot recently about the importance of financial literacy mm -hmm. with a lot of organizations and a lot of nations trying to build that ground for the general public. So I want to start with asking, what does financial literacy mean to you? And Elena, if you're happy to kick us off, what does financial literacy mean to you from your perspective at the OECD? Well, uh, I just want to, to stress that I'm coming from the OECD. Thanks very much for, for saying it several times, Nurhan. Uh, there was a, a mistake uh, on the um, uh, PowerPoint that introduced us. The OECD is an organization of 38 member countries, but in terms of financial literacy, we're working with uh, many more countries. We have uh, what we call the International Network for financial education, which is focusing exactly on financial literacy. And uh, it has 
has 132 member countries. So um, we are, um, it has been actually about 20 years that we have uh, focused on financial education. And uh, from a comparative perspective, we have worked on financial education with this uh, ne network, which we call for short INFE, uh, since 2008. So uh, according to INFE, uh, the work on financial education and financial literacy can focus on their three main aspects, which are financial knowledge and skills. For example, we have in the OECD published uh, what we call financial competencies uh, frameworks for adults, for young people. Uh, also, uh, financial behaviors. Uh, and financial attitudes. Uh, so uh, the financial literacy is actually uh, sounds like a, a really straightforward concept, but it's much more complex than it seems and requires uh, mu uh, much more effort than uh, one can imagine to build financial education because um, from the OECD experience, we have seen through the years uh, that financial education is um, kind of... Um, lower than uh, we would like it to be. For example, in terms of financial knowledge, um, it's uh, sad to say, but uh, in general terms, it's around 12.7, uh, according to our latest survey of financial uh, literacy, uh, which was out in 2020, uh, out of uh, 21 score points. So it's really low because we also need to uh, remember that our um, questions uh, for this survey focus on basic financial knowledge. So mm -hmm. there is a long way to go and financial education is uh, and financial literacy are far too important in order for us, different stakeholders from governments, from international organizations, from uh, private, uh, the private sector, from uh, the wider civil society to overlook this element. We have seen that uh, there was the um, global financial crisis uh, in 2008-2009, which has lasted for a long time. We have experienced the financial um, uh, consequences of uh, the COVID-19 and the pandemic, and we are now witnessing a really uh, serious uh, conflict. Uh, which can have uh, very uh, important uh, consequences for uh, the financial well-being of people around the world, not to mention the migrants and refugees from Ukraine, uh, which is yet another uh, topic of financial literacy. So uh, this is really a very important topic. It has very important uh, and very different um, um, elements in addition to these three elements, for example, uh, in the OECD, we have through the years we have had the possibility to work on, uh, as as I said, financial literacy of migrants, but also other key uh, target groups of uh, financial literacy, like youth, um, uh, sometimes women, uh, sometimes senior populations. We have. Uh, worked on digital financial literacy, um, on uh, behavioral insights, etc. So it's a really important topic we think we know, but there is a lot more to learn. And uh, for that, uh, it is important to um, join forces. And I'm grateful to be here to discuss these topics with you. Amazing. Thank you so much for your inputs, Elena. Just so I can make sure that I took away all your points correctly. You're referencing financial literacy to be financial education, but not necessarily. Uh, we're just talking about basic financial information and financial knowledge. And I just wanted to double check a concept with you because you mentioned on the, um, I believe, the survey or the research the OECD has done that the rating was 12.7 of a ranking of 21. Are we referring an international scope for the respondents or are we looking at particular areas? Yes, uh, we. I mean, financial literacy is what they said. Uh, we just define it as financial knowledge, financial uh, behaviors, and financial attitudes. Financial education is what we do, for example, today, uh, trying to uh, increase the awareness of people and uh, uh, instill some uh, good financial decision-making uh, skills. Uh, our survey actually is international. It has uh, participants from uh, various countries, from the OECD membership, but also beyond.
I can send you a link in the chat if uh, you want. If, uh, people yeah, want. I think that would be interesting for our audience. And of course, we are going to build on that as we proceed during the session to make sure we have also the on ground experience. Uh, but thank you very much, Elena, for that. William, if I can move on to you and again, what financial literacy means to you, perhaps from the CFA Institute perspective, and if um, if you think that's a valuable tool to the average household or to the average man or the average woman. Let me start by thanking you, Nurhan, for this opportunity and thanking the organizers, Robos Advisors, for this great conference and the great opportunity for the CFA Institute to be amongst very esteemed organizations on this panel and esteemed colleagues. Um, what financial literacy uh, rings in my, in my brain is uh, the best investment in yourself as a household. <laughs> There's no better investment I can think about. Uh, some people might tell me watch, car, bag, etc. No, it's financial literacy. And it's not me who's saying that. It's Warren Buffett, one of the most successful investors in the world uh, and the still living in legend of in successful investment in the world, who said that's the best investment you can do in yourself is financial literacy, by the way. But I would combine it also with experience. Then it becomes, because now we're still after COVID, I, I, if you want to be vaccinated for life, you need these two jabs, these two shots. One is financial literacy. The second one is experience. You need to have your own experience with financial markets, with, with investing, maybe slow amounts, small amounts, but still combine these two tools and never stop learning. Let me, let me finish by saying never stop learning. If you stop learning, then you are obsolete. Now, let me add another tool, which is a risk management tool. Financial literacy is a risk management tool for a household. If you know where you're going, if you know what you're investing in, uh, then you make educated decisions, you make wise decisions, you put emotions on the side, and then you go ahead with financial planning and really making the best out of financial markets for your own financial goals. So I'll repeat myself again, Ruhan, before you repeat the, the, the essence of that, is invest in yourself by really getting the latest available financial literacy for your household, yourself, and everyone in your household, uh, keep on learning, combine it with experience, but stopping learning is not an option here, and use it as a risk management tool to reduce the risk you will be taking when you are saving and deploying those savings in financial markets. Thank you. Beautifully put, William, and I know that yourself and the CFA Institute are doing a lot of on-ground work, so I'm going to make sure that we reference that during the session as well. Um, now, conscious of everything you said, which was a very nice kind of simplistic introduction to the concept. Do I take it that you think it's a valuable tool to the average man and woman from your perspective? You think it's a it's a no go without it? Is that what I picked up? It's a vaccine, so you have the choice now in life to be walking without a vaccine or have a vaccine. For me, it's a vaccine for life. It gives more meaningful conversations when you are with your advisor or your, your financial advisor, your banker, whoever is managing and helping you to manage your wealth. If you feel you need to be well prepared and to understand and go the next level in your conversations and in your asset management uh, exercise, yes, I definitely um, uh, recommend it. And I will use the, the image of the flywheel. Imagine you're trying to push a flywheel. The first two moves will be very difficult. You're pushing that wheel. It's hard to turn. But as soon as you are doing this, you are educating yourself, it, it's the muscles you are building to the wheel. And then your financial advisor starts helping you turning that wheel by also helping you to educate yourself, not just bombarding you with information on the opposite, trying to make you understand where you're going. Because if you don't understand, you should not invest. And I'll repeat it later on in the conversation. If you don't understand something, you should not put your money there. But this flywheel, by you understanding better, by getting your own education, some education from your financial advisor, etc etc then this flywheel starts spinning once it starts spinning it starts making wonders and you need less effort to make it spin for yourself and generate revenue for for yourself amazing thanks a lot for that william um iman i think it's a it's a great time to go over to you now because i know on the ground in morocco with the finance with the foundation for financial literacy you're actually doing the groundwork when it comes to raising that sort of awareness. So if you have something different in terms of the definition of financial literacy, of course, but I also would like you to shed light in terms of, um, do you see on the ground that there is already sufficient awareness levels? Are we where we're supposed to be when it comes to financial awareness? 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Norhan. And I want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Elena and William, uh, for all what the, they said. Uh, I, I confirm it because um, uh, financial literacy or financial education, uh, I, I want to to speak about it in a, from an institutional perspective, since I work on it from uh, uh, several years ago. And uh, in Morocco, we started working on financial uh, education uh, since 2007 and 2008. And we have a dedicated uh, institution, which is the financial, uh, the F Moroccan F Foundation for Financial Education, uh, compound from uh, institu financial institutions and, and educative uh, institutions, and uh, led by the, the governor of the central bank. You know, we have that we have given to this. Uh, to this topic, uh, all the importance uh, from uh, an international uh, institutional uh, uh, perspective. Why? Because of the the importance of the the, the topic and the importance of it uh, from uh, for uh, individual uh, well-being or individual uh, resilience, and also for the and the impact of uh, the individual uh, resilience. Uh, on all the the society and all the the, the financial um, the financial market and the the the, whole, the society at whole, the topic of financial literacy is very very important. And as William said, uh, it's never enough. As Elena said, uh, the 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 levels are very low. Uh, in Morocco, financial literacy is a fundamental level for the development of financial inclusion at all. At, uh, um, and um, you know that there are a lot of uh, uh, international bodies concerned by the topic that are working every day on how to develop financial uh, literacy, how to the level of financial literacy and how to develop it through financial education, like World Bank, like OECD, like IMF, like uh, uh, Alliance of Financial Inclusion and uh, so on. So um, the results of the several studies show that low levels of financial inclusion are associated with low levels of financial literacy and that the most financially literate individuals are the most able to plan for the long term and they are very few. Um, the interest has grown in the wake uh, of the this um, COVID-19 crisis uh, which has brought to the floor new forms of financial fragility and new needs for financial skills to help achieve financial financial resilience. At the same time, the digitalization of financial services and the emergence of new financial services and concepts call for a massive development of financial education programs and the involvement of all stakeholders in their uh, uh, delivery. So, you know, the challenge is, big, is getting bigger and uh, we need to uh, to to involve more and more institutions uh, financial there is no one there is not one way to develop financial literacy there are a lot of ways and we have to combine to combine it there is no one topic of financial literacy there are a lot of topics there are investments but also there is there is some um, basic knowledge but there are Knowledge, there is development, um, more knowledge more developed than basic knowledge. Um, there are a lot of topics, a lot of institutions, a lot of targets. There are young children, uh, senior uh, women, uh, salaries, uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, all the components of a society are getting targeted by with specific. Uh, financial uh, education and financial literacy programs. So it's a huge effort, uh, but and we can we can uh, measure the impact easily. So it's a long time effort. Also, uh, uh, we have to be convinced that we what we are doing now. It's not it's for now, but we are constructing something for the future. Sure, absolutely. Iman, I think you raised a couple of really important points and words on your on your um, 
when you were answering the question. So you raised financial inclusion, financial literacy, you've raised uh, resilience, you've raised around the challenge, which together with your help today, we're going to try to decipher it and break it down so we could see what could be actionable points for our audience today. But um, essentially speaking, I think you covered a very nice large spectrum, which I can take those and start building with my questions with your help now. So thank you for building the ground and helping me build out the ground. Um, <laughs> I'm actually particularly interested about the upcoming question, um, largely because uh, when I was researching this session, I came across multiple forms of research that suggested that humans are practically hardwired to overspend, some more than others, obviously. Apparently, the act of overspending lights up our brain pleasure systems. And what we're trying to raise today is being aware of what may be affecting our financial decisions will lead to help us make more informed decisions so that we can avoid that feeling of regret maybe or the temporary happiness and be able to build on the long term as Iman was suggesting and William as well earlier. So I, I want to address the element of the linkage between psychology, our state of mind and our long term financial and investment decisions. And William, if you'd like to help me out with that, um, how do you see that linkage between psychology and the long term financial investment decisions for your household? Uh, le let me start with an interesting conversation I had with my niece the other day. Uh, she's studying psychology in Paris for the second year, but still she's so much uh, interested in buying a bag, a luxury bag. And she's telling me that that's an investment. And I told her it was it was like around dinner. I said, listen, it, if it comes to her, if it comes close to investments, I should be aware of that, right? And she put all these arguments that, of course, she's copying from her friends, their websites, the marketing tools, the advertisement, etc. So there's a preparation for the minds of the youngsters to really fall in love with some luxurious brands and be addicted at some point and hold the conversation that's an investment. I used at that time the Warren Buffett quote, don't buy things you don't need because you might have to sell things you need. Yes. And I used an extreme, a more extreme example, which is let's say this summer we don't have wheat on the market. We don't have, because in Ukraine they're not planting, they're fighting fires and they don't have time to plant. If they don't plant, we will not have um, at the end of the day um, enough flour to, to, to make bread. So what do you do with that bag? Would you slice it and grill it on the barbecue and, and eat the leather that's on the bag? So I'm, I'm using an extreme example because if you ask now a refugee who's running away from Ukraine, what did they what did they carry with themselves? They'll tell you maybe maybe a jacket to stay warm, a pair of jeans and shoes, and that's it. Even the trolleys for, ba for babies, unfortunately, are left behind on train stations because there's no space on the train to take your baby's trolley with you. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here because I'm, 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 I'm conscious I'm, I'm drawing a very negative image here. But when you let emotions drive your investments, you cannot expect great results. When you let marketing and lots of efforts happening now on social media pushing you to invest in one way or the other, you will not do great. You will do great when you control and down those emotions by having a plan, by putting financial goals for yourself, maybe sending the kids later on to university. It costs that much in a certain amount of years. Do the present value today. See how much from your salary you have to save on a monthly basis to get to that education educational goal. Maybe you want to have a house for retirement. Maybe you want to own a sailboat for retirement. It all starts today when you start saving with discipline. So I would replace the word emotions with discipline and then go by a certain golden rules of, of, of managing your wealth. One of them would be rebalancing. Lots of people ask me, how do you manage to buy low and sell high? I do not manage it. I'm not a prophet. I don't have a control. I do not predict how markets will behave. All I know is that I have an investment plan I signed for 15 years ago that keeps on buying a certain amount of asset classes to diversify my investment, to reach certain financial goals. And when one of the asset classes goes up by valuation and price, it's too much already. The, the advisor starts selling from that asset class to invest in other undervalued asset class or underperforming asset classes. And this is how you achieve what we call buy low and sell high. But 
it, it, you cannot predict it. It's just by having some discipline and not emotions that you end up doing that diversification and that way of entering your market. I hope I, I, I answered your, your, your uh, question, uh, Nurhan. I did. So I'm just going to take that um, for another round with you just to make sure that we sent across the message really clearly. So what I picked up from you is you do believe that psychology or the overall kind of um, environment affects your decision, similar to the example of your niece that you kindly gave us. But you think that countering that can only be done with putting yourself on a disciplined plan. So it's it's like almost inevitable that emotions or or the environment is going to affect us, but we're going to need to counter that by having a solid thought through plan. Did I pick that up correctly? Amazing. So and also, William, um, because I thought this was a very valuable point that you shared when you referenced yourself in your financial plan, you said you had a plan that's been running for 15 years. So that largely means if you have a plan, great, it's working for you. If you don't start soon, because time is of the element. Absolutely. And this goes for the two populations living in the GCC. The expat population will have nothing. The local population will have a publicly sponsored pension scheme, but it won't be enough because unfortunately, oh, actually, fortunately, we overlive our life expectancy, right? Thanks to science, thanks to the new medicines, thanks to lots of effort and research, we, we might end up living longer than we thought. What would do we do if we live longer than we thought? We need those savings. So if you overlive your savings, that's a bad thing because yet you're alive, but you don't have enough to, to walk on the street and consume and you need someone to support you. So it always works to over um, sorry, to yeah, to to engineer for yourself an investment plan that will help you as an expert to compensate for the fact that you will not have anything uh, in this part of the world to compensate for your retirement. But if you are relying only on one source of retirement, which is the public uh, uh, pension plan, please make sure you have a second solution that's a private one because you want to sustain yourself for your old days. But also, if you live longer then you also you have that extra source of income. You always need an extra source of income. That's beautiful. I think you've highlighted a couple of important areas, which I'm going to take away with me and build on them, because I acknowledge that a lot of the speakers or, or the panelists here are identifying maybe challenges or things that this side of the world particularly will need to focus and work on. But what we will need to do as the session arises is to highlight areas for improvement and highlight how we can build on that right we're raising awareness on how to make sure that the future is better and this is my objective with your help today so we're we're i'm sure all the audience as well are aware that there are challenges coming and you know getting up after a covid two years or one and a half years has been difficult for plenty of people so we're going to try to break that down as we proceed and obviously to use your investment tips as well william to help guide us um iman i want to move over to you for one reason i just discussed investments with william and he gave me a very comprehensive response there i want I want to move over to you to discuss savings, right? And I know a large part of the work what you're doing on the ground for financial literacy with households will revolve around savings and how they can save better. Now, I want to reflect on the area of psychology and linking that with savings on the ground. How do you see families responding to that kind of um, to these kind of changes because of the way they think and because of the way they feel? OK, OK. Uh, in our financial literacy programs, we consider saving skills to be a major skill to be developed for all individuals, including households. Uh, why, uh, why saving? Because the uh, because the very purpose of developing financial skills is to achieve financial resilience, which is the ability of the individual and house or household to cope with uh, and overcome. A financial shock. Saving skills facilitate the acquisition of, of skills uh, related to day-to-day -day, day -to -day management, financial management decision, planning for the future, for the medium and for the long term, uh, skills about uh, concerning debt management and skills concerning insurance. You know, you see that only in saving, when we develop, we want to develop uh, financial skills and financial uh, behavior on, on saving, we have to develop a lot of other topics related to uh, saving, uh, especially day-to-day -day financial management, insurance, uh, debt management, credit, 
and the um, uh, planning for medium and long term. However, there are factors related to the culture and uh, to the general state of mind uh, in society. Like uh, we have in our Muslim or Arabic uh, nations, we have some fatalis fatalistic spirit. Uh, we, uh, we 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 uh, we have the culture of dependence, as William said. Uh, our seniors depend uh, on on the, the young generation, on their sons. Uh, uh, yet our society is is uh, getting more modern. Is uh, there are things that are changing, but the culture is that is that. We have the culture of fatalistic. If something is going to happen, it will be happened, and uh, and it's okay. And uh, maybe God, we ha we we have uh, we will have some help from neighbors and some help from family. And uh, um, there is also the psycho psychological factor specific to the individual and the relationship with money. Our relationship with money isn't good enough. We haven't constructed, for, and it starts from the from from the 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 childhood. Uh, everything we live in our societies is rather favorable to excessive conceptions, and especially to the exhibition of conception to immediate material plead, pleasures rather than uh, hidden pleasures and individual long term pleasures. To the to, of the values of we have not the value of preservation of resources and uh, saving for future days. Uh, what we experienced during the COVID-19 crisis and with what we are still experiences raises or raises uh, awareness of some lives risks and their financial impact. We have seen that the sanitary uh, there is a virus. Uh, it's sanitary uh, problem that had a huge financial and economic impact on very uh, on individual on the nation national impact but a very small individual impact and uh, and per perspective uh, so we had a economic social psychological situation of households like in morocco we conducted some studies uh, just uh, after uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, and we noticed that, uh, and we saw that 34 uh, 34 uh, percentage of uh, household claim to have no source of income due to the closure of their activities during the time of lockdown, and 22 percent uh, percent tape into saving. So right. at least they had saving to take into, but uh, you can imagine uh, how uh, the situation of a household that could that had no saving, that had no money uh, saved before, and they are going to be uh, and uh, and the the amount of uh, indebtedness. Absolutely, I think Iman, uh, Iman, you may ha you raised a couple of important uh, elements as well around um, you know long term planning and how savings are important in case God forbid of a crisis of some sort or like we all the, always an investment call them having emergency funds just in case something pops up you're ready for it. Um, you also highlighted an important element around culture, which is obviously um, uh, always a debatable topic because um, culture can be seen to be you know like you said it was dependent on fate but a lot of people uh, in the region understand that the culture especially in the middle east is very well knit family driven so everybody is kind of just like i'm doing my hand like everybody's going to be with everybody and that's the concept that we are running on on a lot of the middle eastern cultures and i do believe that um middle easterns take a lot of pride in the way the family dynamic operates within the system and i think what we're trying to highlight is that that's a wonderful way of running. Uh, obviously, it's part of the culture, but how to embed literacy within that to ensure that it's ongoing for the long term to preserve families and to preserve wealth and to preserve well-being. So, of course, thank you very much, Iman, for your contributions on that. Um, Elena, I want to move over to you largely, and I did um, keep uh, you as at the last part of this question because I do know of a valuable piece of research and market work that the OECD has done around um, savings and investments in the linkage of psychology. And I know you've had interesting findings with that piece of research. So if you can help us shed some light there, it would be great. 
uh, thank you very much, Nukhan. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, worked actually on um, uh, more broadly on uh, behavioral science in order uh, to understand um, many uh, aspects of uh, our economic life. We have also, uh, in particular, researched uh, financial uh, behaviors uh, as they relate to financial uh, literacy, and then uh, this uh, helped us formulate uh, some uh, policy conclusions which can help in uh, promoting financial education. We have worked on uh, this relationship for many years. Our last publication is from 2019, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, its findings. But in the chat, I'll also share with you um, uh, links to uh, a number of uh, other publications that you might find uh, interesting. So. Um, as um, William mentioned at the beginning of uh, our discussion on this particular topic, uh, his niece uh, was interested in buying a bag and she was not simply interested, she was really drawn to it and she uh, really insisted on having it. And I wonder uh, what, are, um, the, what the behavioral science would tell us about uh, this need uh, or this uh, desire of your niece? Is it uh, what uh, behavioral scientists call herd behavior or is it something else which is more cultural and related to uh, uh, her way of portraying herself and uh, achieving uh, an, an image of a certain status? So uh, there are some behavioral biases uh, and irrational beliefs that makes us uh, make us take some financial decisions. Uh, they can make us uh, overspend, they can make us on the contrary save, they can make us invest, mm -hmm. and uh, they can make us uh, really make uh, uh, important uh, financial errors. Um, very um, <laughs> Very common uh, examples of uh, uh, behaviors and uh, biases uh, that we can see in uh, financial terms are uh, difficulties with mental accounting, uh, errors, mm. uh, some people are uh, risk averse, uh, some people are uh, on the contrary drawn by risk, uh, people are generally uh, tending to um, overestimate their losses and they are also loss averse. Uh, people also tend to be overconfident when they're spending and uh, our financial literacy uh, surveys suggest that um, uh, they are also overconfident when they speak of uh, their financial knowledge and very often they don't uh, even uh, know the correct answers of the three very important and basic uh, financial literacy uh, questions uh, which are about uh, risk uh, which are about uh, interest rates and uh, which are um, about uh, inflation. Uh, it's interesting to know that when you, we ask uh, people from uh, the different age and from different social groups uh, if they understand compound interest rates, uh, a great deal of them don't know uh, what they are. Uh, so uh, our publication basically um, uh, helped us understand that Yes, there is a very strong relation between uh, behavioral biases and financial behavior. Uh, they also gave us some uh, examples of how we can use financial uh, uh, behavioral biases when we teach people uh, various financial education programs. And uh, they are also helping us understand how the financial decision making of people really works. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we have uh, had some experiences uh, in INFE members, these 132 countries that I have mentioned at the beginning, of, uh, with the use of behavioral uh, insights, and they are using them across the board. They are using them in preparing, in um, designing their financial literacy websites. Uh, they're using uh, financial um, behavioral insights uh, when they prepare their apps, when they use interactive games, when they use uh, various simulator. They also use uh, financial behavioral insights in the classroom when uh, they have this traditional setting uh, and when they teach uh, by repeating, by uh, providing 
uh, examples uh, and anchoring possibilities of uh, individuals in learning uh, so that they can understand better these uh, various concepts. Uh, we have also uh, five key messages to uh, the stakeholders in financial education from the private sector, from the public sector, from the civil society when they deliver financial education. Uh, one, the first of them is uh, in order to change uh, financial uh, decision making, you need to change financial behaviors. And in order to effectively do that, you need to know how people think and you need, for this reason, to use behavioral insights. You need to make your financial education content focused, straightforward, and simple to understand. That means that uh, financial educators need to use short messages. They need to use heuristics, which means rules of thumb or golden rules. They need to use framing. For example, um, people think in terms of glass half full or glass half empty. They need to provide those type of context. They need also to help people anchor the information and their decision making in a comparative term. Right. For example, um, the UK has a um, uh, behavioral insights team uh, which has um, formulated a simple tool which is called EAST uh, for easy, attractive, social and timely messages for uh, generating uh, effect when applying, applying behavioral insights. Then also financial education needs to be as personal, uh, personalized as possible. It needs to come at the right moment for a person, what we call teachable moment. Uh, people need to use also financial advisors when possible so that they can personalize uh, their financial education which needs to respond to their particular needs. And uh, also uh, financial advisors and financial education need to be able to generate trust in the financial uh, system and in the providers of financial products and services. And also people need to be taught that they are drawn to certain decisions. They have mechanical and automatic behaviors, so they need to be uh, informed of the biases, including the cultural biases that can influence their financial decisions so that they can say, OK, I want to do this. I want to buy this bag. And that's normal. It's just because I'm wired this way or just because uh, my um, uh, peers are doing that. But do I really need it? Just step aside, acknowledge their bias and say, OK, I might want to indulge <laughs> because I can do it now but I might want to take a different decision. Then um, it is important also to make sure that the programs prompt, the financial education programs prompt people to take action. It's mm -hmm. not enough to just tell them uh, what exactly. financial education needs. You need to be able to make them take some actions like, for example, prompt them to commit to a savings plan to commit to investment. William has been talking about uh, how he uh, has an investment plan and regularly invests. So these uh, prompts to action, to self-control, to avoidance of overspending or overborrowing, to learning mental accounting, for example, are really important. And last but not least, uh, now we are living in a digital world and uh, we can also use behavioral ins insights when uh, we um, make available digital tools to financial consumers in order to make their financial decisions. Uh, and also when we use digital channels to teach people about financial literacy. Thanks a lot for that, Elena. I think um, generally the three panelists tend to agree that psychology and the mindset and the emotional and the cultural tend to be a very large player when it comes to financial literacy. And I think that was a very important um, point as well for our audience, whether they are 
the ones educating, so they're the, the people in charge of financial literacy, or they are just the audience to kind of get to know yourself better if that helps. So essentially, if I'm going out there and I have zero financial literacy and I want to build on that, understanding myself, understanding what impacts my thinking, what kind of cultural pressures or supporting factors I have, I think would help a lot according to what um, you have shared with me, all of you today. So thank you for that. Um, I'm conscious we still got a couple of really key co topics that I want to cover this morning. And um, your, your conversation is so enjoyable. The time is passing really fast. So I want to jump on to something which is which again when we were speaking to people before the conference um owning a home right a lot of the communities especially in this part of the world owning a home or a property is just almost part of the culture it's embedded it's part of creating a life a part of getting married part of having a family so that sort of a thing is now um almost aligned with a source of wealth so people consider their homes as being their biggest investment and their biggest source of wealth now we can't help and realize the rising property prices all over the world. We're seeing global inflation all the way around. So, um, William, I want to go over to you and ask. You've been in the region for a very long time. You've been doing a lot of work with a lot of the age groups. Are you seeing a change in that trend as property or the house being a source of income or that's changing? There is a change. Definitely there's a change. Um, it's happening with the millennials. Um, we've done some studies on, on millennials, not the Institute, but uh, stakeholders who work closely with the Institute. And we realized that millennials are users, not owners. They use a house, they use a rent and they move on. Okay. Um, they, they don't want to commit to one place. You have intra countries in the GCC movements. Bahrain is working in Dubai, Emirati is working in, in Saudi Arabia and vice versa. You have lots of moves within the region. So, and outside of the regions, lots of young talents are going to work in the US or in Europe, etc., where, where there's a demand for talents. So the millennials are a bit d divorcing with that idea where their parents starting started investing first in the hall, in the house or in their own home. And maybe later on moving to acquiring another apartment and rent it out, etc., which is great because this is the first experience you can get with investing in an asset that is yielding and the yield is the rent. And of course, you have to be uh, conscious what you're buying, where you're buying, you know, it's location, 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 etc. But it, you pay the price, but then you get the value of what you invested in. So I'll leave it on the side now as an investment asset class. But it was great for our grandparents and parents to do that because that was their first experience with how you buy, how you invest, with what, what level and how you generate yields. And if you're not generating yields because you're living in that house, how much you're saving on those goals and maybe some some good investors within 10 years, they amortized their investment. And now they had something to use as a capital for another investment or to use it like they do in the US. They use it as a as a collateral for a new loan and a new investment. And then you can multiply and create sometimes a real, a real estate portfolio for yourself. But then you're only invested in one asset class. The millennials want to be diversified. They want to be light. Hence, they don't invest in real estate. They don't really um, put a, put all their savings there. Some some of them cannot afford it, by the way, with yeah. with the prices and the global inflation. Some of them can because, as you know, real estate is a real asset and it adjusts to inflation. So mm. while inflation has been building in in the recent years, some millions cannot access that, and they go for what we call short term rent or um, sharing sometimes um, uh, housing. So definitely, sorry, it's been a long answer for a short question. Definitely, there's a move and a divorce between the old generation. Mainly real estate is the golden asset to now the millennials saying, no, my golden asset might be a basket of new asset classes coming to the market. And I'll stop there. Thank you. No, of course, William, this was an important question, so I'm glad you took your time. I just want to be a little bit more specific when you say millennials. Are you saying millennials in the region? So are we talking about international uh, and a changing international trend? Or have you seen that trend also change in the region, GCC kind of Middle East more specifically? Um, I, I'm afraid that uh, we, we I cannot speak anymore about local trends because with globalization, I don't see a big difference now with, um, let's say when I go and speak at universities, I don't see a big difference between the local 
at uh, millennials and the expat millennials. They all almost tuned to the same channels and have almost the same behaviors. And I'm afraid I don't have enough data to separate the local millennials from the uh, global ones. But let me tell you that the local millennials were more attached to what their parents did than the expat community, right? But it looks like now with globalization, we are getting under the same influence uh, influence from uh, from those trends happening on, on, on social media and in other uh, media uh, venues. Thank you, William. That was a very authentic answer. I appreciate the inputs on that. Um, I can't speak about households, and obviously William was just telling us about how investments uh, in terms of buying property is becoming more expensive. So we're also seeing a general trend in the market for an increase in credit. And um, Elena and Iman, maybe you agree with me, but during COVID, we saw the, the pressure that credit has applied to a lot of households because of uh, the pandemic. So I would like to move over to you, Elena. Um, if we're looking at uh, at property, but from the perspective of credit, from the perspective of mortgages, and how that more generally affects financial performance for families and households, um, would you have any inputs there for us? Uh, thank you uh, for this question. Actually, uh, I would like to shed light on uh, something else. Actually, uh, people are probably uh, more cautious when uh, they uh, engage in a long-term relationship and uh, uh, have a mortgage than uh, when they use short-term credit. And sometimes uh, what really rocks the boat, the family boat, is uh, the short-term credit. And actually, we did a piece of research on that and focused uh, very much on the relation between uh, how uh, financial consumers need to be protected better and uh, how we can uh, increase uh, the performance and the awareness of financial consumers about uh, the benefits and the risks uh, pertaining to short-term credits through financial education. Well, obviously, uh, short-term credit can uh, have very uh, important role in uh, uh, helping us fulfill our financial needs, but it also can be uh, to the detriment of uh, the consumers and uh, especially uh, for the uh, most vulnerable populations. So as uh, regulators um, uh, need to do some more uh, in order to especially protect most vulnerable populations, but also to help increase uh, the generally low levels of financial literacy uh, of uh, populations. As regards short-term credit, they need uh, also to ensure that uh, there is um, uh, good information about the terms and conditions of uh, the short-term credit, that uh, all the related prices and fees are well disclosed, uh, and that uh, um, credit providers, the market providers, are, are really con conducting themselves uh, properly. Uh, also, we have the digitalization uh, process going on, and uh, uh, in terms of credit, uh, it is important to ensure that uh, the digital provision of and the personal data is not misused. Uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, important to know that uh, consumers uh, can be exposed to unfair lending, uh, which can lead to over indebtedness. And there are some risky uh, products uh, which um, are really um, unreasonably priced and uh, consumers need to be aware of uh, available alternatives uh, uh, to these uh, credits, uh, which, uh, for example, can include the payday credits or the cash advances, which can be extremely uh, highly priced. So for, for uh, our lesson, for the regulators is that they need to move beyond disclosure. So they need to um, make sure that the providers of credit focus uh, and uh, disclose their special features and especially uh, the costs of uh, uh, credit products. Uh, also, the regulators need to mandate special warnings to financial consumers uh, and also to enable financial consumers to go to financial education websites of the responsible financial authorities to look for information and to understand what where um, what their rights are and where they can re seek redress. Uh, there can also be some caps on the cost of short-term credit so that the most vulnerable groups are not excluded 
and can have access to short term credit because we all may need in certain periods of time uh, need, uh, access to access such uh, short term credit opportunities. Uh, they also uh, the regulators also need uh, some responsible uh, lending procedures such as affordability rules, uh, the limit on rollovers and refinancing so that uh, over indebtedness is avoided, uh, a limit on the number of the loans that a consumer can hold uh, at a point in time or over a given period of time. So in financial education, I um, Short term credit sheet should be part of financial education and um, we can focus on the basics in terms of teaching financial education and not specifically on short term credit and the basics can help even in the field of short term credit by, for example, uh, supporting uh, all people, including the youth in uh, the development of positive financial behaviors and attitudes uh, in promoting savings habits so that uh, they can uh, go just for one short term credit or two short term credits, but not to pile them up and take huge risks. And also their saving habits can help them withstand the shocks that um, of uneven income or crisis periods that we have been mentioning. Um, people also need to know how to build a credit score or a credit history where this exists so that they can lower the costs of borrowing. Uh, we can also uh, help people by using digital platforms and digital tools and calculators uh, to help them understand exactly the framework and the impact of the short term credit uh, on their financial uh, wealth and also provide them with the incentives to shop around and to, to compare before they engage in a short term credit. And uh, finally, just to go back to the behavioral uh, insights, uh, we need to help them overcome uh, behavioral biases uh, when they go for short term and even long term credit. Elena, thank you for the very comprehensive answer. I think from, from what I'm picking up from everybody here is financial literacy seems to be a uh, uh, a, wi a much wider scope in terms of stakeholders, right? So even if we were initially saying people need to learn, they need to understand better, but you were suggesting now that there has to be regulator involvement in terms of, you know, facilities that are available, caps on rates, uh, awareness on terms, what financial institutions can and cannot provide for um, low and average income earners. So that kind of input from the regulation, because I also noticed that there was a comment from one of the audience speaking about the regulatory involvement. And additionally, you referenced a lot, and so did William, on the importance of digital availability and that and that cannot you cannot create financial literacy maybe if you don't have the apps and the advisory to support it to allow for that easy transition so i think the points that are being raised in terms of a more um comprehensive inclusive solution is is much better than the initial thought that let's create introductory videos or or sessions on financial literacy and leave it at that because it seems from what i'm picking up from everybody that that will not be enough for the long haul True, true, really. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we picked that up. And I think it's going to be a really important action point as well as part of the conference to raise that it's not going to be one person or one individual's action point alone. It's, it's, it needs to be a more kind of immersive um, initiative. Definitely, it's a complex world and uh, uh, there are plenty of uh, uh, parameters that uh, come into play and uh, there are many stakeholders that can help or uh, that can have a detrimental effect on uh, our financial uh, well-being and uh, our wealth. Absolutely. Thank you, Elena. So I'm just taking a look at the watch right now. It looks we're almost approaching 11.05 and we've got like till 11.20 and still a couple of important points that I want to make sure that I deliver with your help. So Iman, if you wanted to touch up on any elements regarding to credit, uh, if you have any brief inputs there, it would be great. Um, okay. There are uh, topics around risk that I want to spend some time on before we wrap up. Okay, just uh, briefly uh, concerning credits, as you know, uh, trends in terms of financial uh, behavior change 
we saw it uh, according to socio-economic uh, context and of the country and region, according also to the prevailing culture and also according to the target itself, young uh, people, adults, household, employee, entrepreneur, urban and rural. Uh, so in this purpose perspective and uh, since we have not enough uh, financial and psychological insights uh, for every target, we develop uh, uh, um, models on credit. So uh, in this perspective, we do not limit ourselves in our training session or programs uh, to a, sim a single example of uh, like the acquisition of a real estate property, but we first work on the skills related to the setting of life uh, objectives, short, medium and long-term long objective and how to reach those objectives uh, through saving and uh, through credit also. For credit, uh, the skills are related to, to linking the financing to the purpose of the credit, to the choice of the adapted credit, to the calculation of the global cost of the credit, uh, to the comparison with other form or possible financing op options, to the goal being uh, the financial uh, is the, that's the the goal of the credit is how to develop or to develop uh, the person through the development of its or her or his assets. Okay. So more customized model is what you're suggesting, right? Something that is very specific to the stakeholder, to the end user. So we're not, it's not creating a burden, but more to be a facilitator. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing. These, these are wonderful inputs. I think everybody is like really much in sync. And I, I'm going to recommend to FinTech Robotex that we have a more comprehensive, in-depth one. It seems that the studies that are done there are mind blowing. So um, we'll make sure we get that through to them. Um, Every session that is going on online right now, or, or like a lot of the Instagram posts, William, you may have seen, they're speaking about NFTs, they're speaking about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoins. And I'm not going to speak about that as an investment asset class at all. That is not the objective. I'm addressing it from risk appetite. We're seeing um, the general average investor or average user going in saying, how do I buy cryptos, putting in their savings or any part of their income on it. and. I'm just wishing if you could use this platform to address the point of risk appetite, which you started the session with right at 10-10 at when we started. You were speaking about risk appetite. So just everything that's happening in the world and risk appetite and how that is very important to, to financial literacy. William, please. So again, I'm going to steal the words of Warren Buffett. Risk is actually not doing, not knowing what you're doing. Risk is when you invest by not understanding what is the asset class. Um, again, Warren Buffett, never invest in a business you cannot understand. No, of course, I do not understand fully cryptos. And I do not fully understand NFTs. That's why I did not invest yet. Let, let me just say it out loud here. So then uh, I do not get questions on, on the asset classes. Uh, for, for an asset class, for me to consider an asset class, not just I need to understand it. I need to see, let's go back to the real estate example, a house, I can buy it, live in it. And that's um, that's already a yield I'm getting, which is living in it for free, if you can allow me this expression, or I can rent this asset, which is a house and get an income. And over 10 or 20 years, depending on the location and the original price, I can get back my money, which is covering my investment, and then have better yields on that asset class, or then sell it and make value on the price. So an asset class for me is an investment that can yield something for you and where you can make also a benefit from selling it uh, later on. Uh, if you find these in cryptos and NFTs, please go ahead after understanding all the risk. And thanks for repeating the risk, uh, Nurhan, because the risk is not something that marketing uses. Risk is not something that sells. Uh, talking about risk, like we, we mentioned Ukraine earlier, to understand what we really need uh, when, when there's a war or unfortunately a crisis. Um, nobody tells you about risk. I think no, no, Ukrainians, uh, no Ukrainian living in Kiev or any other city thought about the risk of being invaded one day. But it's the same for asset classes. Nobody thinks that the value of their investment can go to zero. But actually, it happens so many times. 
Nobody thinks that the scheme they are going into can be a Ponzi scheme. And we know what's a Ponzi scheme. We're seeing, we've seen Madoff, we've seen before Madoff. Uh, by, by, the, by the way, we call it Ponzi because there was an individual who went to the US from Europe. His name was Ponzi and he was going village to village. Communication was not as good as today, but he was telling you, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you two in one week or four in two weeks, etc. And people got excited because their one dollar looked like becoming two. They wanted more and they... And there is greed here that we can link also to behavioral biases that uh, Elena mentioned earlier. Uh, this behavioral bias of accumulating risk without really realizing it, also I can blame on financial education. So you have to understand any asset class because what you're putting in it is years and years of hard work and savings. For me, savings are uh, sacred. When I speak with other people who manage money in their careers, when I was managing money in my career, I always said, this is not your money. This is hard work of people who spent years and years working, saving, trusting you, not to enrich yourself with high fees, to enrich them with future uh, realized financial goals. So again, it's a job for the financial advisors to explain the risk, for your own education to understand the risk before you get excited about a new asset class that looks rosy on social media, but at the end of the day, wouldn't be that rosy. Can I just go back to my niece? Because it looks like the whole session is around her. Yeah, I she's very she's a celebrity. I mean, yeah. she's the, the take of the session. Yeah, later on, I'll send you her uh, Insta page. But <laughs> when I asked her, uh, the $10,000 you might use today to buy a bag, did you know that with the 3% interest rate, real interest rate, invested in a very boring asset class would become 40,000 when you retire. And her eyes just opened because I asked her at the same time how this bag will look in 45 years. So this is the question we need to ask ourselves. I'm so excited about something today. How it's going to look later on? How do mm -hmm. I look later on? And when I look this way in 45 years, she, not me, but how much the $40,000 will be precious for you when you just start retirement at the age of 65. It's always the question, what are we getting excited about today? Letting go the risks and how do we want this? Because risk is reward actually. Risk is actually reward for yourself. If you accept a certain amount of risk, this should be rewarded. And I invite everyone to get familiar with the notion of risk adjusted return going forward. Don't use the word return. Ask your advisor, ask everyone around you to stop the marketing gimmicks and talk about risk adjusted return and how many years I need to hold on an asset class, how patient I should be, and then how after that I should go and then invest if I'm convinced about all the risk adjusted returns. Thank you. Thank you. I think this session is tying up beautifully in terms of the concepts that we're introducing. So we, we spoke about discipline earlier, William. Now you're suggesting look at yourself in 45 years or whatever. So ask yourself, what do I need versus what do I want right now? And help build on that for the long term. And essentially, your niece was a very nicely embedded example as well. But it, just for the sake of the audience, uh, we, we've worked, I've worked with William before, so I know he's suggesting if you're comfortable with the risk and you understand it, by all means, any risk is open for you to take. We're not particularly discussing asset classes per se. We are discussing the understanding of an asset class. And I just wanted to send that across to be crystal clear because we're not advising on products. We are advising on concept of how to get into a product. So just uh, just to clarify, but thank you so much for that, William. Um, Elena Niman, we're still on this question, but Elena, I want to take it from your side from I mean, I spoke to William about NFTs and Bitcoins, but, you know, we're seeing the same thing with video games. Uh, we're seeing the same thing with uh, with youngsters going in and trying to, you know, buy and sell things online, which is which is fine. But Bitcoins, all that kind of thing for younger individuals, maybe even teenagers. And I know that there was a question, I believe, from uh, Mr. Roshan on the chat discussing the role of parents when it comes to financial literacy and how valuable is that? So, Elaine, I just wanted to go over to you um, kind of a, a brief response on your two cents on that topic and the involvement of parents when it comes to risk appetite. Uh, thanks very much, Nurhan. It's a very important uh, topic, and uh, I would like to say that, uh, frankly, uh, it's cool. Uh, uh, I mean, all these digital uh, tools and uh, cryptocurrencies are really cool, and uh, uh, they attract a lot of uh, young people. So, uh, 
it's uh, sometimes as parents we are kind of at a loss because uh, it takes uh, our youngsters uh, two, three, four months to start learning about uh, cryptocurrencies and then uh, we're in an uncharted uh, territory and we don't know exactly how to talk to them. And um, I read a piece uh, recently when uh, they were explain. Uh, they were explaining that, uh, frankly, a really good student, a uh, serious uh, boy, teenager, um, asked their parents to open an account uh, for digital um, uh, currency for him. Even though uh, this was not allowed, this was not legal, the parents helped him. And not only uh, did they do that, they also uh, learned something from their son and decided to invest themselves and then their son became kind of addicted uh, every morning when he was um, waking up he was looking at his app to see to what extent his uh, investments have been going up etc uh, and he has been involved in management and uh, the parents themselves as well but is this healthy uh, do we need as parents to uh, condone the, this type of behavior and also um, do things which are not necessarily uh, legal for our kids? Do they uh, understand, even if they're very smart and they learn uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, investing in cryptocurrency, are their brains uh, really uh, formed enough uh, in order for them to understand the risks that William talked about. And I would dare say that uh, they are not experienced enough. And uh, if there is such uh, legal provision, it is, it is there for a reason. And uh, we have a big responsibility as parents to learn about these risks, to learn about also the risks of gaming and uh, the risks of the hidden costs that uh, our children pay uh, in um, not only in buying a video game, because at the end of the day, the costs uh, of buying a video game uh, are limited and known in advance, but the costs of buying various products uh, that uh, come along with the, the video game are something uh, also to be uh, monitored. So as parents, we need to keep ourselves informed. It sounds overwhelming. But I may um, give this advice to parents that uh, they need to learn, they can learn. If they don't know, they, they can simply say that they don't know and they can reflect when speaking with their kids and come back to them at a later stage to say, we will continue the discussion when I have a more informed basis to make a decision. Uh, and also one important thing uh, of parents to teach kids about risks is that people learn not only from what you are telling them from the example, but more from the examples that you are giving them. If you have a sound financial behavior, if you are thinking of the long term, if you are not taking reckless investments and reckless financial decisions, uh, if you are uh, informing yourself before taking financial decisions. This is what your children are going to uh, remember and are going to learn from you uh, at, the, at the end of the day. Again, the same takeaway message, our dear audience, it's, it's, it's a group effort, it's everybody's involvement, it's a general understanding starting from the home out, but largely risk adjusted returns to enable financial literacy, resilience, and so on. Um, I'm conscious I have only four minutes left, and I know that we've shared a couple of very important concepts today. So I wanted to make sure that I wrap up with a round around all the speakers quite briefly. If somebody heard you today and you inspired something in them to say that they feel that they don't have enough knowledge, that they want to build knowledge, they want to start somewhere. If we can take a round of telling them Something really simple. Where can I start? What should I do? William, over to you. Um, I'll just give you a few golden rules that I wrote 20 years ago, and I think they're still, uh, they're still uh, accurate. Start early. Don't wait. Start investing early. It's a $20 a month, $10 a month. Start early. But of course, do your due diligence where you're investing that money, how, how much the fees are, etc., which products, etc. So do what we call investment profiling. So where with lots of questions asked, you can get to know how much risk you can tolerate and what's your uh, investment goal. So start early, 
learn about, continue learning, never stop learning. I said it earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it again. So financial literacy, but also continuing professional development and professional learning. Uh, don't put your eggs in the same basket, as my grandma used to say. So diversify. If you drop one basket, the others are safe and you still can carry on your journey. So really, diversification has never been uh, as important as today. Don't get excited and don't fall in love with one asset class and neglect the others. They may introduce your overall risk of the portfolio and save you. Uh, rebalance and don't do it yourself. Have an automatic rebalancement of, of or rebalancing, sorry, of your asset classes because this is the best way to capture opportunities. When markets are down, you'll be buying. When markets are too high, you'll be reducing your exposure and reducing your risk. Um, and that's something I, I'll, I'll, I'll insist on. A crisis is actually an opportunity. When there's a crisis on one asset class, it's an opportunity for you to enter this asset class if it's suitable for you and if it's good for your portfolio. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, William, we need to also thank the Tomi family for being with us today and all the examples. We're joined by your niece and your grandmother. Oh, that's it's all wonderful inputs. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Elena, if someone was to start, do you have any resources in mind, something you just take away from you today? Well, uh, I would um, not speak of resources. Uh, pretty much everything has been said. I just want to say that um, Financial, sound financial decisions are ultimately about the financial well-being of people. Uh, that helps them uh, to fully meet their current and ongoing financial obligations, and they can feel secure in their financial future and um, live the life they want and make the life choices that um, really suit them. So uh, my three, three words at the end is first, financial education, second, financial education, and third, financial education. So wonderful po point taken. Very well made. Thank you, Iman. Over to you. Any uh, kind of final points? OK, just uh, talking about uh, risk. I wanted to say that uh, the zero risk or risk zero doesn't exist. So uh, we have to uh, yet uh, things are going uh, are getting more complex and there are hidden risks before uh, we put money on uh, uh, at home and it can be stolen and uh, or eaten by mouses but now uh, uh, money is uh, getting new forms and uh, there are new actors and there are new ways of uh, using money so uh, uh, things for uh, financial literacy and for financial education is getting complex and we have to emphasize our uh, uh, our efforts and to contribute all stakeholders should contribute to the development of financial uh, literacy of a different uh, population or different targets that was my answer for concerning the risk and concerning my messages and last messages as uh, William said all times are good uh, it's it's good to start and it's very important to start early, but all times are good to start uh, tracking your finance and uh, in order to grow and to grow uh, and let your wealth grow and your well-being and your re resilience is an important term, the resilience, the financial resilience to grow. Financial literacy does not concern a particular profile or particular target uh, or a, a given level. It concerns everyone uh, and if in every stage of life, parents, uh, children, uh, young people, entrepreneurs, we should ch change, we should change our relationship with money. It's time to change it. Uh, and don't be ashamed uh, to follow your money and to want to develop it. It's not something uh, that, uh, because in our culture, it's something like a shame to be, um, uh, to, uh, to pursue this uh, ambitious, to be, to get uh, better financially uh, uh, in terms of finance. Saving and investments are are areas that require additional financial skills and monitoring of economic development. We should uh, be very interested with the economic development in order to know the impact on our financial uh, finance and our own uh, uh, money or the financial development. It's necessary Absolutely. to be inter interested in the subject to seek the permanent sources of information 
and to follow them regularly. Because as William and as Elena said, it's not a, a question of a day affair. It's every day learning, every day, every financial. We, we don't have to be. It's not uh, about a huge or big financial decision. It's every day decision making. Uh, and for everyday decision make, making, we have we need some specific skills and we have to develop it by ourselves. And for all stakeholders, we put we should put our efforts together to help people to get uh, their financial the knowledge and the understanding. Very, very valuable points, Iman. Uh, I, I think we're just about to wrap up right now. I want to let the audience know it was a pleasure being <laughs> with you today uh, all the questions that you noticed in the chat i actually embedded within my questions so we covered the three questions in the chat already as part of the discussion that we've had so just to make sure that our audience today had a voice with the speakers william tomey from cfa institute thank you very much elena mativa from the oacd iman benzarel from the financial um from the foundation of financial literacy in morocco it's a beautiful morning with you today i think there's so much to share for everybody who was listening cfa institute oacd and the uh, foundation of financial literacy in Morocco have a lot of resources available on their websites. You're more than free to reach out to check those out. Additionally, we are here today in this platform to encourage real change, to encourage the change coming from you. And to I hope you found the last tips that our speakers here shared with you today to be excellent starting points from you. That's it from us this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you one more time. We'll see you in another platform on another day. Take care. See you. Thank you for having Bye. us. Thank you. Bye.